G'day brothers and sisters, this is The Other Paul, joined by my friend Craig Trulia, and we are going to talk about how we made history. <laughs> oh, we, we made history, all right. <laughs> oh, we did, we did, we did, we did. That's right, the Great Schism doco that came out, how long ago was that now? Uh, last Thursday. Thursday. Little, 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 just, just over a week now, so just over a week now it came out. Um, he His idea, Craig made the uh, idea, script, all that research. And I had the humble role of making the whole thing. <laughs> so <laughs> that's up now. <laughs> so that's up now. And it Paul is genuinely taken off. It is taken off. The count's right now at like one, uh, 8,157 views, which is pretty darn awesome. And I know his Craig's sub count has gone up a, a measly few hundred since it came out, which is pretty darn cool. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to be talking about that today. The documentary itself, maybe, maybe... Maybe even some stuff about uh, production, but also just the situation itself, including my own take as a Protestant. Since this doco, the um, actually one of the production stories, pretty much the very beginning. The only reason why I agreed to this uh, when when Craig initially gave me the idea, I was like, "Yeah, I don't know, because this could be some pro orthodoxy stuff. It's against my views. I don't want to make content that goes against my fundamental beliefs." But then when Craig framed it as it's going to be an inter orthodox Catholic thing, so within that debate. From the orthodox side and then so it's like okay i don't have a dog in that race so i'm perfectly fine with that and that's why i ended up making it so that was a that was an interesting tidbit um and that's that's how this uh, that's how this thing was born many many months ago <laughs> well anyway, hang as, on, and i was a big believer in your video editing i i think the most underrated video on your channel is on the easter controversy and we already have a whole stream talking about it so i won't belabor it but it's very neutral. It goes into the sources. It says it pretty quickly. It goes into the original languages. What else do you want? Yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a very it. good video. I mean, that's that, that I, video I, should I, be I'm actually kind of disappointed with its performance myself as well. I, I'm not going to lie. It only has barely a bit over 300. You know, I'm going to share the link right now uh, just so people can hopefully maybe even uh, obviously share in the original doco link as well. So I'll put that. Whoopsie daisies. My stream is overlapping. I'm going to put the original doco first in the stream uh, link so people can go and watch that. You definitely should if you have not already. Um, but otherwise, if you haven't seen my other my, my original doco uh, from ages and ages ago on the quarter decimal controversy, check it out on my channel. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Anyway, so. It, which it is. Yeah. And, uh, and so, and, and you're in the video production. I saw, what I saw in that was a was a talent to do good video production. I said, you should consider making a side channel. It's just history documentaries and church history. That, that's how this kind of conversation got started. And yeah, yeah. But the other Paul's like, uh, I want to make money. And so <laughs> the, so that's why I think if, guys, if you got projects and ideas and, and you want to pay money, I think the other Paul's a good guy to talk to. Of course. <laughs> Go mm. got from Got some breakfast right here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's true. That's absolutely true. People, please. I'm actually wanting to put up a little side hustle for video editing, making video productions, even small docos like this. Um, virtually any Christian persuasion, uh, as long as it's not framed against my beliefs. <laughs> the man and guys, the man needs to eat. Look, that's it. That's it. I need to eat. I need. I need this breakfast. I need this. Uh, I need this bacon, cheese, and egg on toast uh, breakfast, guys. I need. I need. I need to get that bread. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll do I'll do basically anything as long as it's not framed against my beliefs. If someone if someone wants to hire me for a uh, great for another great schism doco from the Romanist case, go for it. <laughs> there, there you go. And the, you know the awesome part of that would be with your if you're doing the the narration for both. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be the best part of it. That'd be so funny. Let's say hello to people in the chat. Matthew Carvin, hello, hello. Matt Bell, lovely to see you as usual. Likewise, Senora for Mador. Hello to the Zwinglian and to the Orientalist. How good. Alan Rule, lovely to see you as well. Hello from Canada. Long live the Filioque. Yeah, 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 nah. <laughs> so wait, yeah, you're, no. you're a Protestant against the Filioque? Uh, I think so, yeah. And so like... Being that that's a, a creedal statement the Anglicans hold to, would you just like, well, I'll say it, but I interpret it according to an orthodox manner, or how do you discern that? Pretty much that, because the whole, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more open to that whole original um, from the Father through the Son, and that's what I've heard Roman uh, thinkers and apologists claim. Well, that's what we always meant by it. We always meant that by it. But then looking at the research in your doco, it's like, well, no, there was actually... Uh, there was like the Carolingian dude saying, no, we don't mean from the father through the son. We mean truly 
and from the sun. So, so it, it, it gets really interesting. Who do I believe in that? Uh, given your research is definitely deeper. I'm kind of inclined towards that. So, but yeah, otherwise, otherwise an idea of through the sun, I'm much less objectionable. Um, I'm, I'm willing, I'm, I'm willing to go with that. Yeah, Josh, thank you for the $2 as usual. Love both of you. Canadian, Love you as well, Canadian $2. <laughs> That's true. Canadian, Canadian dollars. Popery is dopery says John Chrysostom. Thank you very much, John Chrysostom. Very cool. <laughs> Andrew Bailey, hello gents. Lovely to see you as usual too, my man. Uh Dalton, isn't it no longer in the 2019 BCP? If that's true, that's pretty uh that's pretty based. <laughs> What's BCP? Is that Anglican? Common prayer. Okay. Yeah. Uh was trippy to hear the other poll elsewhere. That is true. That is very, very true. I wonder how many people were like did not know. I wonder how many people missed the prior announcements about oh, I'm 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 narrating it. And then people heard me and they're like, wait, what the hell? This isn't Craig. <laughs> I, I think people like, oh, he hired the Sham Wild dude. <laughs> Sorry, crew. Anyway, um, what do we want to start with talking about? Because I was just kind of winging it today um, with what we do. Like, do you want to, I don't know, do you, do you want to kind of summarize your case in the in the doco for people who may not have seen it? Which they well, should. Well, if, if they haven't seen it, they, ha- they got to see it. It's only yeah. 23 minutes. So hmm. let me just make... Maybe like kind of, this is almost the director's commentary, though you're really more the director, I'm just a screenwriter. Is that the idea was, how do we talk about something really important, but very concisely, so like people actually watch the thing, right? Mm. And I actually had a a previous article, which is the skeleton of the documentary called, uh, Who Started the Great Schism? Um, A Concise Answer or something like that. And, And it's pretty much, that's all the, documentary strives to be is a concise treatment of the topic but the beauty of that particular topic is that conciseness is possible because it's not terribly complicated to see what went down if you just understand a few church canons and a few definitional things so a problem with youtube in a way which i think in apologetics where people get into like these personal spouts and stuff and all this entertainment and there's very little content if you actually kind of distill what's in the channels Mm -hmm. and they have multi-hour streams and it's because people avoid like this defining things and so then you know actually what are the premises they are working from and then based on that what are the conclusions and then if you so if you apply that method to the great schism you you find out very quickly that the definition of what's Catholic is something very specific. The definition of what the church is something very specific. The definition of what schism is is very specific. But it doesn't take that long to unpack. And then once you do, it, it, it's something that people will treat from a thousand different angles. And they'll go, oh, I can't read every book in the world. I can't give an answer. Well, actually, if you define these very basic things and it doesn't take too long, then you could actually answer the question very fast. I mean... The schism itself was only like four or five minutes in the documentary because you could answer it very quickly once you've established all those other things. And then those other mm-hmm. things all have applications to all to the doctrine of the papacy, to the doctor of ecumenical councils, all this stuff people spent hours and hours and hours arguing about. And I feel like that one one commenter I think summed it up. He said, I was expecting something, I was expecting this to be for hours. He said, but in 23 minutes you covered hours of information. And and mm-hmm. That is a successful YouTube documentary, right? Because we're 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 not making hearts and minds. We're not doing an hour and a half filmmaking here. You know, people mm-hmm. want twenty minutes. They want the answer to all life's problems. Well, at least in this one, we gave a pretty good shot at a big one. Yeah, that's what I really appreciated with how you with how you structured it. Because as you said, very little of it actually addressed the main topic at hand. But that's that's only because you only needed that much. And really, what what keeps what holds it all up. Is the foundational premises you established before and so you doing that in a very concise manner with constant 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 citation of original source works which which already sets this apart as well like, I, I, I like to think this is a common feature with this doco and my quarter decimal one just constant citation of the sources of all the necessary sources used used and because that's what frustrates me about otherwise really good documentaries from other channels like kings and generals for example they, yeah. they make amazing Documentaries, oh, cool absolutely stuff. amazing and yet they very minimally cite sources and very often they'll say some of the sources say this but others say that and it's like which ones can i can i please <laughs> <me> which ones <laughs> but but and that's what that's what will set this one apart because it's really as a documentary 
um, with with that many sources and and that much of a methodical going through of the of the issue, it's almost like a it's almost like a condensed like university course on the issue with all the stuff you cite in it, how methodical the information is, and and that's what I think really sets that docker apart. You did a really good job with with, with structuring it, um, and of course me recording and putting it all together. Oh boy, that was that was a fun mission. But other than that, it was it was just really really well done. Well, like uh, one of my friends is a economics professor um, at Colgate University, which if you're in America, may probably didn't hear about in Australia, but some Americans know about it. And he, one of his side jobs, when he needs more money, is he edits economics textbooks and go, well, I can read English. Why can't I edit an economics textbook? And it's because an economist has very specialized knowledge so that when he's editing something, he knows what the terms are. He can understand if it's used slightly inappropriately or if a picture is matched in the wrong thing. And so just being the production guy doesn't make you need someone who knows what they're doing and understands the content which you do. You can't just have some random flunky do it. And so you're essentially like him with economics with church history. And so that very much shows, though we obviously have different perspectives and you said different foundational premises, which I want to talk about in a moment. Mm. It shows that it's, you're someone who has to be taken seriously. You shouldn't. You couldn't. You can't be dismissed, even if you're self-taught, because you you clearly understand the content. The fact that you're able to orchestrate it as he did. Tony, always catch me while I'm eating. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna. You keep chewing, and I'm gonna yep. say one other thing, which is, in a sense, you and I could have more of a real debate over the content of this video which which could call the video into question than myself and a Roman Catholic. What do I mean? Well, with the Roman Catholic, they'll run into issues such as like, we accept what St. Ignatius says about Catholic. We accept what St. Vincent de Lorenz says about the definition of Catholic. You we know, accept all your premises. <laughs> you know, we, so to then call into question the interpretation of those sources requires ultimately rejecting what those sources say from the Roman Catholic perspective. And so this is my challenge to Roman Catholic filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers is what they won't be able to successfully do is what is is make their case in 23 minutes. It's not because they're dealing with more information. Actually, the Orthodox have, in a sense, way more source data we got to work with. It's because what they're going to find is their whole ecclesiology didn't exist in those early sources. You can't source it. You can't like, like I did, I quote uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 something, and right, I could actually go to scriptures and then show where they connect to St. Ignatius, and then, then show where they connect to someone in the third century, and then they show where to connect the fourth century. You could rapid fire through this, and it's very convincing because you could string the pearls from the Orthodox or Roman Catholic perspective. But if you have a purely Roman Catholic ecclesiology, which was absent in these early centuries, which is absent in these scriptures, which is absent in all these foundational documents, then what you're left with is we have a worldview. I'm going to speak as maybe the papist uh, documentary filmmaker. We have a worldview which is purely papal in outlook, which only takes into account what popes have said, and which has mostly risen since the ninth century. So... You could make all the king's horses, all the king's men try to bring back Humpty Dumpty, but ultimately the history of your ecclesiology starts really in the ninth century. And then once you have that, it's just not a very convincing documentary. If it's who started the Great Schism, well, it's, of course it's them because since the ninth century, we were right. That doesn't sound good. Now, let's compare this to you and I, the Protestants. Yep. You could say, well, I don't interpret that scripture as you do. Mm. I don't interpret St. Ignatius as you do because you are harmonizing him with St. Vincent and he centuries later, right? Mm. So while that would not be an objection a Roman Catholic or Orthodox would raise, because our our method of herme hermeneutic interpretation of the fathers is so similar, though not identical, because our hermeneutic for, which we're going to cover next Friday on my channel, our hermeneutic for looking fathers is so different, and in a sense, the scriptures as well, that leads to where you and I can have a very different discussion on the schism. Oh yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Which, in some ways, you can make a more compelling counter case than the Roman yeah. Catholic can. Yeah. Really, I mean, as you as you yourself said, like, and I'm not out as say, I'm not exactly the PhD guy on this, but I think I have a decent enough experience, enough of experience in these worlds to kind of say that just just as you say, they're they're really 
cannot be a Roman Catholic case without denying any premises of their own faith because it's simply building on common premises between you guys. Like maybe the one thing they could attempt to do is just try to challenge the historical data of what actually happened, which I, as, as far as I'm aware, you can't really even do that either because as far as I'm aware, it's pretty pretty clear with some of the basic facts that you build that you build these things on. Um, and whereas I, whereas, as you say, I would be able to, I would be able to do that because I don't share those premises necessarily. And, you know, me, it's uh, you know, it's the, it's the good old fashioned me and my Bible under a tree. I can say whatever I want. I can believe whatever I want. Good old tree. <laughs> I am my own, I am my own Pope of the, of the church of me <laughs> as, as people will caricature my position as. And so, uh, in a non-character way, yes, that's 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 definitely true. I could uh, potentially do a counter case. I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think I would I would try that anyway because the doco is purely focused on ortho versus Roman Catholic. Unless you decide to do like a second part yourself, where it's like, okay, here's why Protestants are wrong. Then I'd be like, yeah, okay, time to re- time to get back. But, at see, you. I wouldn't have to because from my worldview, there just there'd be the schismatics of schismatics. So that's yeah. that's why for you, I think it would come down to is. My definition of schism's wrong. My definition of the hmm. church is wrong, right? And hmm. if and if that's the case, then the Protestant ecclesiology could work. Hmm. And it's, maybe you could give a sneak peek because I don't know when you and Father James are doing the response video to me and Trent Horn because uh, you guys came up, if you will at all. But presuming that you do, some of those same foundational disputes are going to come up, right? And so I wonder if you have any thoughts you want to share with the audience now, just so they could say, well, the producer of the film has some very different views on these issues. Yeah, that's it. And and, and it brings me, brings me up to a funny idea I had ages ago. Like, what if I did my, a response stream to my own doco? <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's just me saying stuff. And it's like, okay, so this is wrong because X, Y, Z. It's like, Paul, hang on. What are you, schizo or something? You have multiple personalities arguing against yourself? I think I, even just for the meme, I actually might do that. Just to, Maybe you um, should. I'll, I I'll agree. Give my, I'll give my thoughts here with some good detail here, of course. But then maybe I'll even do a stream in the future where I kind of systematize it along with the doco. So I watch it and give my comments as it goes. <laughs> just, just be the most, just be the most schizophrenic stream in, in YouTube ever. Um, but yeah, to, to kind of, to kind of give with summary um, with my own view, it would be that the church is not one-to-one. Uh, well, one of my, well, one of my major assumptions would be that the church is not one-to-one correlated with a specific uh, visible administration. That's all. <clears throat> that's all under the same, all under the same administrative uh, authority, so to speak. So the the, the church universal, uh, it can be found among many other n- numerous groups, whether it be individual congregations or whole denominations, which nonetheless hold to the same fundamental faith given by Christ, even if they're administratively diff- uh, independent, even if they do have great disagreements on certain issues, and yet they can nonetheless recognize a common foundation among themselves. Uh, and then with the with schism particularly, it's one I'm still kind of developing because it is it is a tricky issue. But I believe one area where I would diverge from you and and the Romanists would kind of be where I don't think necessarily. Um, well, for one, well, actually, well, for one, I don't even hold to the whole idea of uh, of like sacramental validity passed down by an exact material succession from the apostles. I don't even I don't even believe in that concept at all. So. That's, oh, that's come on, you know you want to. That's oh, I don't. Tr- I, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it'd be fun. It'd be it'd be fun to affirm that uh, Pastor Brian Houston sits on the chair of Peter. But um, apart from that, well, Sash because he's you're, not on you're, him. You're anymore. Anglican now. You could actually sort of like kind of like yeah, no, we could lay claim to that. We can, we can. That's, that's the thing. I, th- I think we can. And like when I read, I kind of skimmed through it, but I read when I read portions of Apostolic Cure to try and argue against their. Uh, their valid holy orders. I was like, bro, that is like, that is like, sh- oh, it's, all, it's ultra at lame. Straw. Yeah, it's grasping it at straws. Like, oh, you guys, you guys said this word different. And it shows you that you didn't have the right intention. And it's like, bro, yeah. are you like a postmodern? I, I, I do want to say it, it comes to, it comes across as a very Donatist, right? It's like Roman Catholic Donatism Kinda. because, you know, they, they accept the baptisms, all these people and stuff. Uh, there was simony in the church. Hmm. So, the Orthodox Church as well as the Roman Catholic Church. Hmm. And so there's simony. So you can't say there was correct intent behind the <laughs> behind the ordination. They're for the money. 
Hmm. Um, there's been black masses, all sorts of black magic and stuff going for years. That's, you know, that's something, obviously, that's more of like Jay Dyer studies the occult and stuff. But the occult didn't, like, appear in the last hundred years. This existed for a long yeah. time. But somehow, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, but, but, but some of the Anglicans screwed masters. it up. They screwed it all up. <laughs> you know, it's, to me, it doesn't make sense. And that's why, like, sort of the orthodox approach to it is easier. Because they say, yeah, everyone's just not us. It's all, they're all up the creek, right? So, like, they could be consistent like that. But the Roman Catholics have to say, well, the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox and the Assyrians, they technically have holy orders, but the Anglicans don't. And like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It never made sense to me. Yeah, these guys who split from us literally fifteen hundred years ago still have valid holy orders. But these guys from just five centuries or so, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, forget it. <laughs> what? Why is it? Why is that the case? Oh, Papa said so. Simon says. Simon says. Don't forget. <laughs> and what? What makes the whole Simon says name so better? So much better is that his name is Simon Peter. So it literally is Simon says. Um, there you but, go. On, on my view of schism as well, uh, I, I would, because I don't grant that I'll, the whole idea of um, sacramental apostolic material succession, uh, I I open up the I'm still developing kind of my still kind of developing what I what what scripture says what the word of God itself says about the nature of schism and whereas with orthodoxy or Catholicism it would just be um, it would just be ipso facto not good. Because even if you have even if you have like a bad priest or a bad bishop, for example, they still have that sacramental unction, and so yeah. you, you can't just go in and just yeet them out the building and just claim to do your own thing. Because as you said, there will be the whole issue of donatism and all that jazz. Whereas I, I, I myself, and I think um, perhaps many other Protestants, if they were to think about it, um, would grant the whole kind of kind of kind of taking kind of taking from the spirit of the of the how would i say of the pre, of the presbyterian writers on the nature of government and all that how the people have a right to fight back against tyranny and all that i'd be of the opinion that if there was a truly bad shepherd in the church and or bad shepherds to the point where there's no other good shepherds there in the congregation to correct the ship then the people would not only have a right but really a duty just to throw out the guys originally there and God willing, by God's grace, be able to establish a new leadership amongst themselves, um, which will be difficult, could be painful. But I believe I don't. I don't believe Scripture rules that out. Uh, scripture rules that out ipso fact uh, in and of itself. Now let me ask um, you because I didn't get to watch it. Yeah. Did Doctor Gavin Ortloon kind of cover that at all? His recent video on the most misused verse about the gates of hell, not uh, mm. right? Because that yeah. seems to me. You know, a way you'd approach that would be, well, this doesn't mean that, you know, your Episcop you know, your your episcopacy or your church government is totally indefectible. Right. Yeah. I, I presume that's was his argument, but I haven't watched it, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, that. yeah. So that was so his video there, that was more just on the church universal, whereas excuse me, this issue would be more pertaining to the local level, although I guess it would have ramifications for the church universal, um, because in a Roman or Orthodox view, a single bishop or people overthrowing their bishop or whatever would pretty much be severing them from the church universal. Um, but otherwise, with respect to that, yeah, I believe that if there is shepherds doing a truly awful job and there's no other good um, shepherds, because otherwise if there were other good shepherds, then I believe the people would be obligated to just appeal to those good shepherds to kind of um, kick out the bad ones on the top, the whole doctrine of the lesser magistrate, which is for um, civil government, Protestant doctrine on civil government, but I believe can be readily applied in an ecclesial context. And so if that was the case, then yes, go with lesser ecclesial leaders, rally under them <clears throat> and pray that they can correct the ship. Otherwise, if there's literally no one in your community, then yeah, I believe the people would have a, a, even a duty I do, I to, just find it to hard. abandon those leaders and set up new righteous leaders from amongst themselves, which God willing, I, I genuinely believe the congregation could do because as Christians, assuming there is at least a sanctified state amongst them, they would at least have a basic, uh, they would at least have a basic guidance by the spirit to be able to discuss and come to a point of appointing at least competent leaders above themselves. I just find it hard to believe that you think mm. that there was never, that we've reached a point, there's no good shepherds to to appeal to. I mean, like, there's <clears throat> there, there's icons and veneration of Theotokos and prayers for the dead, right? It, it's always around there somewhere, so why do we have to leave for it? We got everything we need. <clears throat> I'm, not sure you, I'm not sure you're arguing. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm not sure you're All the you're important arguing. stuff. Sacrifice the Eucharist. Mm, which I affirm. 
<laughs> this is, you know, we're talking about the unbloody sacrifice, my friend. <laughs> ah, yes. The unbloody sacrifice. <laughs> For people who haven't, check out my very recent short video on how Protestants actually do and should affirm the sacrifice of the Eucharist because that simple, that concept in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean the author or Roman view. Um, that's another fun topic in and of its own. It, it, in, someone, in someone did bring up uh, in your recent, like your nine minute video on it, which I liked. You packed a lot in in nine minutes. We're, we're this close from TikTok channels, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but but in in all seriousness it's like someone's like oh well with the transubstantiation it's like well do the orthodox believe this like that's sort of like the orthodox become this independent way of verifying roman claims and and just and just to clarify for people yes fundamentally the orthodox and roman catholics are identical when it comes to eucharistic theology i mean it's uh the only thing yeah. i'm not absolutely sure about is whether or not we dogmatically affirm that you could have just the bread and and that equals both flesh and blood. But for example, with infants before they could chew, um, the, the bishop, for example, will just give just the blood. You know, so it's not like we don't do it from a orthopraxy kind of thing. But I don't know if we hmm. affirm that one has the other. That's that's something I just haven't heard or saw in the fathers. But I haven't read everything, so I can't say that with authority. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And that, that I kind of picked on that particular dogma of the Eucharist by Rome in my latest short vid about how the real presence, regardless whether it's true or not, is not, as people claim, a literal reading of the text. And I, I, I did that for like real presence theories in general, but then I particularly went to the Roman view how it's even less literal, where they'll say that the bread is also the blood and the wine is also the body and the soul and the divinity and say that, look, this, this just eviscerates any literal reading of the couplets in scripture of body, bread and blood and wine. And so don't pretend that you're doing a literal reading because you're going well beyond what it literally says, which is a topic, topic in its own right. Um, we've got a, we've got a good, we've got an interesting question here though, from Alan rule who says who started the schism with the monophysites? Well, of course they started it. Bam, there's your, there's but, your answer, Alan. <laughs> but, but it's, I can actually give a, a somewhat more like educational answer, which I'll give now. I have an article on the, on the inauspicious beginnings, the Miaphysite schism. And it's not an issue I thrust myself as much into, because quite frankly, you don't have the same, same amount of primary sources on, on that issue where I could read secondary sources like Yonatan Moss's Incorruptible Bodies, uh, Rise of the Monophysite Movement by uh, WHM Friend. You know, so I can read secondary sources on it, but uh, I like to think I'm a recreational historian. I like actually jumping into primary sources mm. and you really just can't get them to the same degree. But let me give like the, the Cliff Notes answer I've, I have gleaned from secondary sources. Mm. It'd be incorrect to locate that schism um, ecclesiastically to Chalcedon. Because in reality, we didn't have uh, multiple bishops of Alexandria and, and a lot of these other uh, sees shortly after Chalcedon. Um, they would have a single bishop, a single patriarch, they would depose them, and they really wouldn't have parallel bishops. So you really didn't have a parallel church. Now, in my study of the issue, Severus writes quite specifically against a parallel bishopric, and he taught quite specifically that the Diophysites, uh, the Chalcedonians, the, the, who are the Orthodox today, that they are in the church. He didn't view them as a separate church. He just viewed them as heretics, but like heretics within the church. Sort of like how you as an Anglican would view someone that believes in ordaining women, but they still have, you know, there's still a bishop within the Anglican church. Or how Orthodox would view their own liberals or Roman Catholics would view their own liberals. Like we let's just be grown ups and go, all right, we we understand there's heretics within our own ecclesiastical bodies, right? And so Severus was a realist and realized this, there's people I consider heretics within our own body. And so being that's the case, Severus uh was thinking that he might have returned the grace, and so he never he actually cautioned against creating this parallel episcopate. But um, I want to get their names right. I believe it's John of Tella and then Jacob Baradai. They pursued a very different policy of creating a parallel episcopate. So if there was a Chalcedonian in X village or X town, 
um, that was a bishop. Well, now we got to ordain a, a Miaphysite, you know, in their place. And now you actually have two churches, kind of like my documentary. And we know this because we got early sources like 10 years after Jonatella's life, like the guy who wrote his life, I forget the name, uh, his name, but it's quoted in my article where it even speaks of the fact that we know this vi validates, uh, this violates Canon 2 of Constantinople 1. There's an actual church canon that specifies you can't create a parallel episcopate, right? You need the permission of the people there to start ordaining people. Um, and they said, you know you're violating this. And Jonatella's response is, oh, well, it's like a theological emergency, so I have to, right? So it's like, well, I'm violating the canon, but so what, right? And so that's really what happens. They they're, that's why I say it's an inauspicious beginning. The whole rise of their schism is in violation of a canon they affirm, because they affirm Constantinople I. Um, for what it's worth, um, Severus interprets that same canon. Severus existed really before Jonatel, and he was a more important bishop, and he's pretty much their Thomas Aquinas. Severus is the most important person in Miaphysitism. Severus interprets that canon and specifies, even in times of emergency, you cannot violate this canon. So the whole origin of Miaphysitism is in violation of a canon they accept and the interpretation of their canon, the most important saint, their most important saint gives. And so to me, it's a pretty simple who started it. Well, they started it by their own standards. The same exact argument I make against Roman Catholics. Um, it's just that like, it wouldn't make a great video because it's just me reading from secondary sources. And I know there's some, Orthodox YouTube channels where it's like the guy reading one guy's book and he makes a video off it. But that's just not how I do it. I just, I wouldn't want to see a documentary of someone reading someone else's book um, unless it was just someone reading the primary source because I, I will do that with primary sources. I'll just read from the book. So there's the answer to that question. Fascinating. Big answer to that question. There we go. <clears throat> um, he also mentions uh, Orthodox reordain Anglican priests who convert. Absolutely, because like I said, Orthodox consider everyone who's not Orthodox out of the church in categorically in every respect, yeah. right? So even old calendarists are rebaptized and and reordained. Um, rebaptized, you say? You know, <clears throat> it, it's rebaptized in in well in Roe Corp particularly. I wouldn't say that, that exists in every jurisdiction, but yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting because I've, I've I've heard recently about well, you mention it here, but then also. Um, hearing about the concepts of corrective baptism and all that elsewhere in, in orthodoxy. Like this is probably just my small brain, my small brain on this issue because I haven't gone mad depth in it. But how does that not go against the historic church's conclusions on the rebaptism controversy? Oh, well, that, that's a good question. And long story short, it's because the rebaptism controversy actually preserves two different views. And those two different views have been preserved in the canons. And so... Uh, the to really simplify it, there's discretionary canons or economic. That's all like just so ec economia in Greek just pretty much means discretion. It means household, but they mean discretion. And there's rigoristic canons, the way things ought to be, right? So like for example, we have conflicting canons on how many years someone who serves in war ought to not commune because shedding right. blood could in, in one canon in Saint Hippolytus uh, would mean you can't commune the rest of your life. That's how important it is it is not to shed blood. Um, and then, of course, once you have an imperial religion, uh, then then you need your soldiers and their Christians. And it's like, <laughs> ah, just don't, don't commune for a few years. So, and it's been relaxed, but it shows discretion, right? The, the rigoristic view would be the ideal and the discretion would be what you'll permit in other circumstances. So obviously the ideal is you'd rebaptize everyone. But the discretion is, if this is an impediment to people entering the church, we can permit, as long as there's correct form in the baptism, they weren't baptized in ketchup, they were, they didn't have a single immersion as compared to a triune immersion, uh, immersion. <coughs> in that event, then we could permit it. The bigger problem, I think, would be the historic Orthodox approach to unions. They're like the one exception for some reason that honestly I can't give you a good reason for. Uh, units are not reordained. They're simply vested. Okay. And it's just utterly inconsistent with, they won't do that with Latin Rite Roman Catholics. They won't, they won't do that with Oriental Orthodox. They won't do that with Anglicans. They won't do that with anybody. But with units, they'll just be let in. 
<clears throat> and quite frankly, the cannons don't really provide a... Uh, well, they actually do. Because apparently the Novations were allowed to be brought back in that way. And so apparently the units are pretty much approached like Novations. And it's uh, right. it's really interesting. But why them and no one else? I don't know. Hmm. So... So like the so like with, with your with the canons across church history all being in the same set, it's kind of like it's kind of like the Talmud but Christian, like a like a bill like many many different things, many different statements, different authors, different people, different places. Sometimes even conflicting, but all part of the one big compendium, I guess. And and that's the thing, like the Orthodox approach, and this is what people English language discourse, including a lot of Orthodox English language discourse, don't understand is the Orthodox don't approach the canons as Roman Catholics approach the canons. And I don't say this negatively. The Roman Catholic approach, in some respect, is, is easier to defend. Let me explain. The Orthodox approach, very simply, is they're all consistent somehow. You just need some category of thought to, to make them work, right? And like we just said with rigoristic and, and discretionary canons and baptism, you pretty much start affirming opposite approaches to stuff, but you give a reason why you do. But in Roman Catholicism, to quote Gratian, he actually made a collection of canons called the Concord of Disconcordant Canons, right? So <laughs> Roman Catholics could just say, yeah, these don't make sense with one another, right? <laughs> and, and that's okay. And so that's where you'll get in um, in Western approaches to canons like, oh, it, that's a disciplinary canon. So you could pretty much throw it in the garbage. Disciplines could be completely changed out of whole cloth. Orthodox can't say that. We don't have that category of thought. Mm. So we could say, well, mm. we might not approach this because we have discretion not to do it this way, right? Mm. While the Roman Catholic could actually say, no, this canon is wrong, right? Mm. And yeah. it, so in some respects, they don't have to do as much mental gymnastics if that's how people want to. I don't think of it that way, of course, um, uh, out of piousness. But I could see why to an outsider that just would appear the Orthodox have to do these mental gymnastics with their canons while the Roman Catholics could say, oh, well, that's just wrong and it's disciplinary, so it's optional. But you would never see the fathers speaking that way. They never approach canons that way. Mm, mm, very interesting, very interesting. Bene, bene. Senor Fumador dicit hoc est corpus meum. Uh, idest hoc est imago corpi sui. Uh, idest, uh, id, id, idest, uh, idest quod Jesu dixit. Uh, gratias tibi, o senior Eframador. <laughs> now, Sorry for the text, but yes. I wanted to make a comment, unless you would interrupt me, on the lame critiques of the film. <laughs> right? the, I mean, this, this is Actually, a stream really, of... Really quickly, before you do get to that, um, sure. there was a couple other interesting comments I want to look at. Go right ahead. Uh, what exactly is going on between the EO and Orientals? Oh, wait, no, we already kind of answered that. Um, this was the one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Okay, no, not that one either. Um, uh, Alan Rule says, one, there are cases of Roman Catholic priests being vested, and two, Rouge V was OO, and he was baptized again when he went to Rokor. What do you say well, about yeah, that? Well, yeah, so like I said, the units are vested. That does occur. Mm. Um, I'm not aware of anyone that's actually in the Roman Rite <clears throat> having that treatment. And mostly because, let's just, let's just get right to the point, because no one in the Roman Rite was conquered by Russia, Imperial Russia, and they had to come up with some sort of way to bring all these units back into the Russian state church, right? So I think a lot of the policy, though there's canonical precedent, the motivation would have been, well, what do we do in the Russian Empire? So like, for example, in Poland, they would just say, okay, well, the Roman rights are legal. So you could be, uh, well, no, they'd say the union rights are legal. So you could be Orthodox or you could be like Roman right. And so they wouldn't, interrupted the Roman right, but most people that were, you know, uniates actually viewed themselves more as Orthodox, right? There was no, there was no papal newspapers back then, no papal websites. You lived in Poland in 1855. What happened in Italy was totally irrelevant to you, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're given this decision, I could be Orthodox or I could be Roman right. I'm, like, I'm not Roman right. I guess I'll convert to Orthodoxy. So that that's very common. So uh, I, I can't, again, I don't know everything. I'm not God. So I'm aware of units being vested. I'm not aware of people in the Roman right being vested. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And so now you want to look at lame critiques of the doctor. Lame critiques, and, and there's not many, right? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. You know, we're, we're over 8,000 views, and 
you would expect more responses, which I think as which shows it's because we did solid work on the film. The the sources check out. Um, I will start with the one good critique I saw, which was a misattribution of a source. It was from a collection of St. Gregory the Great's letters, but it was a letter to him instead of from him. Oops, you know, that's what, you know, an erratum's for. So it doesn't change the point of anything because it shows in the West that you, they would call the, the Catholic Church the Orthodox Church. It's an interchangeable name, and that's the only point that was being made. So really, it's no big deal, but I'm grateful to anyone who pointed out because the idea is to be accurate, right? So, so that's a good thing. But like actual critiques against the substance and thesis and analysis of the evidence in the film are lacking. Like they, they just don't exist. And it shows you it's because there is no response, which to me vindicates me as a script writer and as a researcher and as a, an apologist presenting mm -hmm. information. Um, one critique from a, a popular Roman Catholic apologist was essentially... It's a bunch of lies and misnomers, I, and I got nothing else to say. All right, well, I, you know, that pretty much shows that you don't have immediate response. You call anyone a liar. That's, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Um, so, okay, fine. The other response that I found uh, was from Set of Acantist, and that, yeah. there was just, well, St. Jerome, you know, said he only recognizes who the Pope recognizes. And so I wrote back to the guys like, you're aware he was writing this during the Malaysian schism. And so by even saying he wasn't recognizing who the Pope recognized, he was actually critiquing the Pope. It's a kind of dubious proof text. And of course the guy got angry and called me dishonest. So whenever like people call you dishonest, but don't show you how you're dishonest, it shows it's really just a concession. Yeah. It's just a concession. It's just, just not a nice one. That's when I always get a smile on my face. When people try to attack the character as if I'm intellectually dishonest, whatever. And then they don't show the example. That always puts a smile on my face. And I just think, okay, I won. I just won. I'm going to exploit and, this. <laughs> and, and that leads us to the last lame critique, which is the narrator's Protestant. The other Paul. I hope there's not <laughs> Protestant nonsense in this. And like you wrote back to one of these, like, I didn't write the script of this thing. So your issues with what is stated, not my voice, right? <laughs> so it's... <laughs> So right, oh. the critique is, how dare he use a Protestant? We're like, okay, well, if you want to make a super high quality film on the cheap, then I will I will hear you out, right? Like, I have loyalty to the other Paul. It's like, like if you come five cents under, I'm not going to like, all right, I'm not going to use you or something. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I'm open to other projects. You just have to be willing to do it. Although I stopped complaining. The guy who's willing to do it did it. And quite frankly, <laughs> you know, in church history, all the time they work with people in other communions. That's like, that's nothing new. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's just, it's one of those lame critiques against because they got nothing substantial to critique. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Enough. I've gotten the same impression as well. Because um, something like this, when something big and decent, like perfect example, whenever Gavin Ortland, Dr. Gavin Ortland breathes, reason and theology comes out with a response video or or some or any any number of other roman catholic things including with his very substantial stuff um well because as they they they'd simply recognize he's he's a big name he's kind of i think i think you yourself have kind of said it he's kind of taken over his he's kind of taken, taken, yeah. he's, he's taken over james white's mantle as like the 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 pope of online protestantism or something um but and so they'll they'll, they'll, they'll gladly critique him and other even uh very intellectual takes by other protestants and orthodox and all that stuff but with this crickets crickets and and not even just from like crowds you know with all the personal dramas and all that but even people who have nothing to do with such dramas like there's crickets just crickets all around really um which is fascinating absolutely fascinating i think that does show that they they they, they, they just if, if they are trying to find make a way of critique at least right now if they are um they're still trying to figure out how on earth they can go about it because they look at all your premises. And as you said, well, we kind of affirm that, 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 and that. And then the end is just kind of like, well, two plus two equals four. So how exactly do you, how do you, how exactly do you do you uh, critique two plus two equals four? <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll bring out, um, maybe we'll push some of them to the more postmodern route, you know, of interpretation. Well, well, that's what I've been finding that the, the longer tradition, uh, traditional Roman Catholics, deal with orthodoxy because it's one thing right they're all when a protestant to know history to cease to be protestant and they put the nose in the air right like 
you know. But then when they deal with the Orthodox, which has a like a much stronger basis in actual history, consider it. Con, uh, I'd agree Take with into that. account the foundational premises are the same, right? So you wouldn't make that concession, but like if you share our premises, the Orthodox have this stronger historical basis. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden you start getting to, oh well, did the Ecumenical Council really say? You start getting these hyper skeptical arguments. They get into modernism. Yeah, actually. and and so I will give he's an old calendars, but I'll give him credit for pointing the term Deacon Joseph Sweden post traditionalism because that's what it is. It's it's a desire to be a traditional Catholic, but employing the tool belt of the modern liberals they disdain so much. And so it's a post-traditionalism. It's, it's, it's not traditional at all. And so, yeah, it, it comes with, yeah, our saints are wrong. Yeah, the councils are wrong. You know, you have, uh, uh, I'll say his name because I won't say it in a negative way, but like Michael Lofton has a reforming ecumenical council thesis, literally that the ecumen ecumenical councils are wrong and then reform one another, that they could teach heresies and then the other council fixes the heresy. You would never have a Roman Catholic arguing that. And they could argue that to a Protestant, why they should accept their doctrines. Because can't the Protestant say, well, how do I know what you say now is right? What if the papal infallibility gets reformed? What if the Immaculate Conception gets reformed? Yeah. There's just no end to it. And so it's, I would say the main reason they're avoiding is like you said, they don't really have a response without really exposing the late medieval view of their ideology, which is really what it comes down to. And I think interestingly, what we're seeing recent, in recent years, because it didn't start yesterday, and let's say in a popular uh, Roman Catholic apologist, Eric Yabara, is they're becoming very fetistic, but with the papacy, right? And so a few years ago, you know, Eric Yabara would try to delineate from the history, these Vatican I claims and whatnot, but it's it's becoming much more, well, we just accept the papacy, and as a result of that, then we just accept mm. things even if they seem to lack historical basis. So, yeah. so mm. as a, I'd like to say the least of Marian scholars, because I'm only published in one Romanian journal on the topic, I was very disappointed in his response to Dr. Gavin Ortlund. Yeah, and honestly, it, that was shocked. That honestly, I was shocked. Like, I, I, I give him mad respect for his honesty and his depth on the issue. Absolutely, yeah, oh, yeah. My, mm -hmm. But my word, that was just shocking to actually hear how honest he was about it, how blunt he was. Like just saying, and it, that one paragraph, even if the first source for the Assumption of Mary was from the 11th century, that wouldn't matter. The Roman Church would still have the uh, would still be right in declaring it dogma. Like my word. Yeah, you because it, right, it's pretense to historical continuity. It's a total forfeiting of claim to historicity, which yeah. was quite transparent in that article. And what I really, when I first saw Dr. Gavin Ortlund's approach to uh, the Assumption of Mary, it's I'm like, man, he really got it, and he hit a home run. I don't think he understood how like. He had a Mickey Mantle 600 footer. You know, he hit the biggest home run. I don't know. He knows how big a home run he hit because, because from the Orthodox vantage point, historicity is absolutely necessary. We, the Orthodox don't have this view where you can just have this monolithic authority and, it, and it's irrelevant. The historical basis is something that it could develop from a seed and it could have just been uh, mm. uh, conceptualized centuries, centuries, a millennia later. Um, to the Orthodox, no, there has to be a arguably compelling early basis, like St. Vincent de Lorenz says, right? And so I wrote a response to Dr. Gavin Ortlund, which was probably like Orthodox got it, but I think it was way over Roman Catholic heads and far beyond Protestant heads, because it requires this sort of Orthodox worldview to even let it marinate how we would approach the historical Why sources. The news? You know, and, and I won't make this article about me making that argument, but it just shows like, the fundamental differences to the patristics that I think the Roman Catholics are forced to take when they run into difficulties, either orthodox claims in ecclesiology or there with Dr. Gavin Ortlund, the secular historians and the church historians are generally behind them and that the assumption is fairly late from the fifth and sixth centuries. And, you know, that's just past the point because also fifth and sixth centuries, you're not dealing with like St. Augustine. You're not dealing with St. Gregory the Great. You're dealing with some anonymous source from a, a Miaphysite or a Gnostic, right? <laughs> right. It's like, you know, at least that's by the scholars. I don't, I have somewhat different view of some of these sources, you know, but the point is, it's like a guy like 
Eric, right, who's just, he's not a, he's not well studied in the marrying stuff so much and he doesn't pretend to be. So I, you know, he, he just accepts what the scholars say as, you know, someone who um, can't otherwise interact with those sources. And he's like, well, then, yeah, I guess we, I guess he's right. We, we can make this state, this claim of historicity. And so I feel they don't want to do that with the schism, right? Because if they do that, the schism, it just lays naked that they're, they're what the, the, Protestants accuse them of being, of just being papists. They're literally just worship the Pope because that's all that matters, right? There's no historical basis for dogma. This is what the scriptures say are irrelevant. It's just what a Pope says right now. And that's very psychologically hard to, co hard to come to grips with. I wouldn't wish that upon a Roman Catholic. In fact, today I was having a phone call on my way from home, uh, on my way home from work with someone who's considering converting to Orthodoxy, and he's pretty set on it. And his wife's Roman Catholic, the whole family's Roman Catholics. And I, I told him, it's like, you know, you have family members who are Roman Catholic. You have to give a honest shake and and really try to see it from the best possible light from their perspective, because it's like betraying family, you know, not to not to be Roman Catholic. And so it's I don't wish that upon any Roman Catholic to come to grips with the fact that like essentially their whole ideology is this kind of this late post enlightenment epistemology it and mm. the basis for it is from the middle ages it's it's not from the patristics but for the sake of their salvation it's in my view obviously you wouldn't view this as compelling i think it's a very important for them to identify yes they're schismatics schism's a moral crime and then it's incumbent upon them thereby to become orthodox and and that's why you know you have no dog in this but that's why this this documentary film is really very devastating for them because for them the response requires them forfeiting so much ground they don't want to forfeit. If there is a response, which I think eventually they'll have to be in some form or some forms for that matter, it's going to quibble over, well, the mainstream view of the Malatian schism is wrong and Malatius really wasn't in schism. It was Flavian that was in schism. And, you know, like, and just like little rabbit trails and stuff that doesn't actually change the overall point. So, like, I expect that, but... Ultimately speaking, because I know the way the sources were dealt with is fundamentally honest and their foundational sources, they are not going to be able to make a good response. Yeah, I think so as well. I think so as well. Wow, for our Islamic clarity in the chat, mate, I used to, mate, back in the whole, um, back in the whole thing with the, with the multiple Qurans and that, when that started kicking off and exploding, um, your, your, your channel, I was, I was following, I was almost following it kind of religiously. You should upload again. It's pretty awesome. Glad to, glad to see you here. It's pretty epic, pretty epic um the other pool we have the same cross oh there you go there you go how good it's a byzantine style but with like this right. bunch of slavonic on the back is this the same thing i don't even know is that the same oh thing? wow it is <laughs> it is exactly the same there you go there you oh, go actually hang on oh no not not exactly your oh uh, you ruined you ruined it yeah very close very close but like if you look at the bottom for example yeah. it's got your yours has like a like a like a triangle and mine's just flat but otherwise very similar very very similar i love it the other Paul has a great voice. Why? Thank you very much. And <laughs> this is a good idea. 4D chess. Mend the schism by becoming a Catholic priest so you can become the Pope and just unilaterally reverse all non-Orthodox teachings. You, you know or, what I thought? I had or, a similar idea. Actually, no, you go first. I was going to say, just be like the succession of Pope Francis and just turn them all Protestant. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that's that's, that, was ex that was exactly this idea I toyed with ages ago. Like, what if I just became Catholic, worked up to the papacy, and then sat on the magical chair, said, hey guys, I'm going to say something ex cathedra and then just say, okay guys, Protestantism is true. <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fly because in the end of the day, the papal infallibility is, it's infallible when I agree with it. Yeah, it's, right? it's infallible. So, when, when the Pope says something right, it's infallible. When he says something wrong, it's not infallible. <laughs> yeah, so like <laughs> when St. Hippolytus says that uh, Pope Callistos and Pope uh, Ziffer or something, I can't pronounce his name, that they're a modalist. Oh, well... He's not specific enough, so we don't know if they taught it ex cathedra synodically to the whole church. I would, right? I would go out of actually. No, you can't, you can't. And so, like, all right, well, how about Pope Liberius and the Aaronized Creed? By the way, Pope Liberius is Saint in Orthodox communion, so like, I, 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 I feel he was tortured, and it's okay. Well, as under torture, that doesn't count. Okay. Uh, well, how about Honorius? He, you know, he wrote in response to a. Uh, he wrote an encyclical to letters uh, to other patriarchates about his view of uh, monoenergism, affirming it. 
oh, well, that actually doesn't count because that wasn't like an ecumenical council. All right, well, how about ecumenical councils uh, condemning him and also uh, the, the, what the Roman Catholics considered the Eighth Ecumenical Council calling him a heretic? And a pope calls him a heretic in a synod to the ecumenical council. Uh, well, I never read that before, so that can't be real. You know, so it's, it's just it's just on and on you go. Because at the end of the day, they'll just say you're an anti-pope the whole time. Uh, someone didn't do the hokey pokey, and so your ordination wasn't valid. They'll just, they'll just, you know what I mean? If, at the end of the day, they'll just come up with some reason why it doesn't, they'll, they'll, they'll you know, why it doesn't apply. But then it, then, then it exposes it's a useless criteria. Here, yeah. Here's my favorite, which is with Pope Vigilius. Um, Pope Vigilius taught that the three chapters were orthodox, right? Like you had to teach their orthodox. You can't condemn them, um, particularly the letter of Ebus. And he taught that the you can't condemn the people there and to make this. And by the way, he only said the letter of Ebus was orthodox. I think he admitted the other two weren't. So I, my apologies. So, but anyway, so he affirms that the letter of Ebus is orthodox. He he refuses to go to the Fifth Ecumenical Council over this issue, holds the counter council at the same time condemning them for condemning the letter of Ebus, amongst other things. Then he repents and then says Satan deceived him and that what he wrote in the first constitution where he said this letter of Ebus is orthodox. Well, that's wrong. And the letter of Ebus actually is heterodox, um, but what they affirmed that Ebus was a different letter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And an apologist says, well, yes, he affirmed heresy, but he did so in an error in, in, in fact. It's not that he actually tried teaching the doctrine wrong. He's just affirmed the wrong doctrine over false pretenses. And then, so if the reason he didn't break the infallibility rule is because he made an error in fact. We must presume that he wasn't trying to teach wrong doctrine. We just presume he made a mistake in affirming the wrong doctrinal document. That's like how old then, happened. Then, then whoever whoever makes whoever commits heresy by that logic, yeah. everyone's making errors in fact. If they only knew better, they wouldn't be a heretic. Well, if that's true of Vigilius, then it's true of everyone. And if the, and if that's our way of defending Vigilius, then it just shows you infallibility means nothing. My what? method with the whole idea, with my, with my idea of going in, becoming the Pope and then declaring Protestantism true and just like, all right, guys, Catholic Church, we're, we're closing up shop. My whole thing would just to be as autistically detailed as possible with getting the receipts of my ordination, my consecration, uh, and, and as well, like the circumstances and bringing about my ex cathedra statements. So like so damn detailed that they would have to string they would have to they would have to grasp for like the thinnest of straws out there they so that once i had the decree that the reformation was correct luther's true trent wrong roman catholicism bad catholic church closed down then it'd just be like okay guys i've got to submit to the pope and not submit to the pope anymore <laughs> it's well i think the supreme court in the united states kind of shows you that it doesn't matter something written in stone like the constitution or something Anyone can interpret anything how they ever they want, no matter how callously wrong. And the quote Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic, justice is the will of the stronger. Might makes right. So if just mm -hmm. by sheer virtue of people wanting it to be X, it will become X. It's Of course, it's not really X, but that's what they will all buy into. So you could not do enough carefulness to invalidate papal infallibility because by just sheer desire to say infallibility is a thing, they will always come up with an excuse. It doesn't matter. Have to agree. Have to agree. Unfortunately, then again, I'd also say the same for orthodoxy in certain contexts. Although the the context in which I'd say it for orthodoxy would almost always apply to Roman Catholicism as well because of the ecumenical councils you'd share. So, <laughs> so I'd say that oh well, you guys go to you guys you orthodox jump over like hoops and whatever to preserve the um the reliability of this council. But it's like oh wait, that's also an argument against Roman Catholicism. So I have so I only have very few specific arguments that are specific against orthodoxy because the vast because the good majority of those I have against orthodoxy also go for Roman Catholicism. It's just the fact that Roman Catholicism has these other extra big features like the papacy and that. That's the only reason why I guess I have more interaction and more specific arguments against Romanism, which which makes sense. But otherwise uh um yeah, that, otherwise in, that's that. In reality, there's so few Orthodox. You know, yeah, so. that's it. Yeah, that's it. 
uh mate is on a cloudy thanks for shout out man appreciate it mate the honor is mine for having you a 10k channel here on my mere 1.45k channel the honor is mine thank you very much um we have also uh, multiple qurans yeah tldr there's numerous like hundreds of arabic editions of the quran throughout the centuries um and the the quran we have today the, the mainstream quran we have today the um the hafs edition i believe uh that's like virtually universal amongst the at least amongst sunni islam uh but the and and that would that would always the the meme apologetics from uh, muslim apologists would be that the quran is perfectly preserved letter for letter word for word throughout all history and then um in 2020 i believe 2020 or 2021 uh the some other good christian scholar apologists go to this speaker's corner place in london which is like a free speech zone uh, in theory and they show off like 30 or 20 something Qurans in their hands, different Arabic editions. And it just causes the crap storm across the Islamic apologetics world. Like it all just comes crashing down. It was a beautiful sight to behold and just to follow it. And so channels like Islamic Clarity kind of hopped on that train and did a good job covering it. And it was just so fun to watch. So fun. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out because I took one course years ago in Muslim theology and people <clears throat> understand is if you get an English language translation of Quran, it says a uh, the meaning of the Quran, because it's not the Quran. The Quran's only in Arabic. Hmm. In Muslim theology, God speaks Arabic, hmm. right? Uh, when you pray, it's in Arabic, or God doesn't hear your prayers. <clears throat> um, uh, there, it's so, long story short, you Arabic is like a big deal, and it not changing is a big deal. So hmm. Yeah, yeah, really. I, I actually do quite, quite commend their whole thing with being like original language and that i kind of wish christians had like at least half of that fervor for going original language not to the point of saying that god only spoke hebrew well, the, aramaic the and orthodox Greek. sort of do it's always been that though right because like i think the, so yeah with orthodox because like the hebrew was like hebrew was always like really a liturgical language they spoke aramaic and greek right so like <laughs> they only kept hebrew around for religious reasons and like uh hmm. christianity starts with koine greek and then kind of uses like neo-attic greek and both become out of date, but the Orthodox maintain them. Or in the Latin West, they maintain Latin, even though when people stop speaking Latin. So it's like sort of been this temptation since Judaism to kind of have the liturgical language, even like Slavonic, like in the Russian tradition. Um, an interesting thing Orthodox do today is they purposely in English translations will use King James English. Yeah. They never want to use the modern language. They always want to use what is like a, for the culture, a liturgical language. In a sense, yeah. in the West, that'd be King James. Yeah, I actually want to bring back like many features of the early modern English. Just it's, it's it's extra precision, like the distinction between the plural and singular second person. So like thou, thee, thy, thine for singular, and then ye and you for your, yours for plural. I'd actually love to bring that back one day. It'd be super awesome. Um, and now we have some now we have some good critiques. So Alan Rule, Honorius was a heretic, no question. Uh, Liberius may or may not have signed the creed. Sources are divided. And Vigilius is the best argument against the papacy, but Agatho's letter vindicates him and Honorius. How do you respond to that? Uh, I'll just respond real quick. I agree, number one. <laughs> number two, um, number two. I'm pretty darn sure that St. Athanasius actually says that uh, he signed the creed under duress and he excuses him for being tortured, um, which is if the saint absolves him, you know, I absolve him and he's a he's a saint. Unlike in Roman Catholics, he's, a, he's liturgically commemorated in the Orthodox Church, um, that pope. Um, for being a confessor of the faith, ultimately. So it's uh, that that's an interest and by me, a Physites, by the way. So that's an interesting tidbit. As for Vigilius, he's never mentioned in uh, uh, Pope St. Agatho's letter. So if, if pretty much the argument that Alan Rule is making, well, Agatho's letter, how I interpret it, is that the Pope is infallible. And so because the Pope is infallible by how I interpret that letter, that must mean that Vigili Vigilius didn't violate infallibility. So it's sort of kind of question begging. So I, I would call that that uh, argument into question. Oh dear, Craig, we're getting some spice. He says, Sozomen and Theodoret don't mention the signature. Well, Athanasius wrote during the time though. <laughs> I mean, Athanasius was alive when he was alive, you know, so, oh well. Yeah, that and I guess I haven't looked at it myself, but like the whole issue would be, um, is it a valid silence? Because not obviously not all silences mean that therefore they didn't believe something happened or something didn't happen. Uh, there's good, there's certain criteria you got to go about. It's kind of a pet, kind of a pet hobby of mine, uh, being very uh, refined with my criteria for arguments from silence because it's very important in my opinion for history for like 
like you need arguments from silence in order to make any historical claim about development or change at all you know and yet unfortunately in 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 polemically or apologetically charged contexts across the board silence arguments are absolutely abused shot to hell and so it's kind of a pet thing of mine to make sure there's good criteria behind it um alan rule i acknowledge the source of divided agatha for the win exclamation mark very nice and moving on pope other paul playing a pro gamer move absolutely yes once i take over the paper c it's going to be where we're, we support protestantism now the roman catholic church quote unquote and then everyone will be and then everyone will be forced to look at like pope michael like hey pope michael it looks like you're right all along you are the true you are the true pope <laughs> i'd love to see that happen and gabriel ferreira hello guys what up good to see you um yo enjoyed your production many thank you jeff slash a goy for jesus it wasn't i did i did too thank you <laughs> very good very very good i didn't enjoy making it not gonna lie just because of my own you know just because of my own lack of discipline back in the time which i'm now fixing up really well uh by god's grace um but otherwise yes the it was very worth coming with the uh coming up with the uh, with the final product so worth it so worth it and let's see let's see the other paul could you tell craig my recommendation oh okay what, what is your recommendation something about watching a video in orthodox shahada about metaphysics or something oh really. okay i'd recommend you watch classical islam's unusual metaphysics by orthodox shahada yeah very nice very nice okay um regarding islam okay so there you go there's a suggestion uh blah, blah, blah. there's something else something else here as well uh well, there's a few there's a few questions but i guess we can just keep um alan rule alan rule has one there oh yeah question for craig have you read the 12th century dialogue between amsel havelberg and nikitas of nicomedia no i've only read how it's covered by chadwick in his book on the schism uh, i took some notes on it uh, nothing really jumped out i was really hoping i was begging you other paul i was begging you to have uh Dr. Gavin Orton present that issue on your channel because I felt like oh. here's a, here's an Anselm scholar. Let's have him do it. Yeah. Um, so all of us, let's beg Dr. Gavin Orton as an olive branch, right? It's it's not really a polemic against anyone. It's just right. He's got no dog in what they decide. They decided. I think that'd be an awesome issue, and he could probably do a good job for us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I remember you did suggest that, but I'm like, yeah, nah, because I'm not gonna lie with a few specific exceptions i'm just not interested in medieval church history i'm sorry with very few ex with very few exceptions and then so even even with something like and someone's like yeah he, I, I guess he could say some cool stuff but it's like it's not my interest man it's just it's just it's just not like if unless the issue is like um let's say certain certain latin councils or the iconoclast controversy um or the reformation of course those things interest me um, apart from that, eh, not massively, not massively. I'm more the ancient boy. Go back to the OG, uh, OG centuries. Uh, is Eastern Orthodoxy compatible with the notion of Christ's imputed righteousness to the believer? Second Corinthians five twenty one, Romans five nineteen, and Sanctikon. Well, I would say yes because I actually think we mean it more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you know, all right. right. So, like, we believe we're credited the righteous Christ, and it literally is christ grace dwelling in us right that that it's an actual impartation of literal righteousness and divinity so um the answer is yes and you could read uh orthodox commentaries going into like saint gregory palmas and everything and that's that's such a important uh passage for for orthodox because we don't get into like forensic justification wasn't a thing and this sort of uh uh i forget what the the whole Roman infusion of righteousness view where you can then lose the righteousness, like it's merits, like you could gain merits and you lose them. Like that doesn't exist in, in orthodoxy. So it has to do with this participation in grace. And so the whole, like I have a debate with a uh, Turretin fan, which I'd recommend. So really, I mess with the linchpins of my position is that. So I'll just say short answer, yes. There you go. Well, I think I think he's, he's probably more meaning with the notion of Christ imputed righteousness, I think as Protestants, classically understand it would that be compatible with orthodoxy where it's like where it is strictly what christ did and the crediting of that to us even before any actual change in us well actually but uh, let me answer this way two ways one to the professional protestant theologian the answer is no but for the general i think the protestant 
the present sense of the doctrine without actually defending it and arguing it, um, I think it's much closer than uh, most people think. And the reason why is, for example, St. Gregory Palmas uh, says specifically about the man that was healed on the bed that the friends brought, brought in. He, when exegeting that passage, he says, at that moment, he instantly attained to all the righteousness of Christ and all of his sins were like taken care of. So it's like, it's literally what how Protestants properly imagine what happens. Orthodox don't reject that. Um, I think where the rubber meets the road is the Orthodox doctrine, the atonement is very different. And so like the Orthodox view that you could forfeit that, that complete experience of grace by pretty much energizing or operating contrary to God's energies, or meaning mm -hmm. to put this in Protestant ease, if you don't do God's will, that pretty much turns you off from the grace of God. So mm -hmm. like the quote of scripture that people hear a lot, um, do not blank the Holy Spirit, what's that word? Uh, it's in Hebrews, I think. Grieve the Holy Spirit? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So like that'd be our application that like you could grieve the Holy Spirit and actually, or you could sort of grieve the Holy Spirit and go halfway. So in some respects, it very practically works out in a way which would be objectionable to Protestants because like, so that means, right, what I do actually affects, you know, how much of the atonement exists that makes my works part of the atonement. And it would, but for a different reason than let's say pur the way Roman Catholics have interpreted with purgatory and stuff. The, it probably, I'm gonna do a video next month on the atonement so I'll get more into this issue. Um, but yeah, the, it's because the Orthodox, if, if you go into my debate, Turretin fan, our whole approach is so fundamentally different. Even when there's parts where the lines will intersect and we're the same, it then goes off in a different direction. Okay. Very hmm, interesting. I, I wasn't sure if that was a contradiction with the more intellectually developed Protestant position, but either way, far out. We got Christian Wagner in the chat. Energies equals essence owned. <laughs> oh, I owned you before I owned you again. <laughs> <laughs> what jace uh, a resident you... newman scholar <laughs> <laughs> what's your thoughts on michael heiser's view on the rock i don't even know what it is um i believe if memory serves me correctly michael heiser um he interprets the rock as in you are peter on this rock i'll build my church he interprets the rock as literally the place they were on caesarea Philippi, oh, no, that's um, ridiculous. Because, of the, because of the whole, there was that place there, that little cave nah, there nah, called nah, the, nah, the nah. Gates of Hades or whatever. And you, so you could ascribe there. to that, but as my documentary shows, that actually put a lot of fundamental Orthodox views <laughs> into question. So absolutely not. All right. That, that's fair <laughs> enough. That's fair enough. Otherwise, though, um, uh, I don't know. Do you know much Michael Heiser? Are you much of a fan or no? Nah? By who? Michael Heiser. Oh, no. I don't follow him. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, saying Tikon, it is impossible to come justified before God and thus saved without Christ, outside Christ, but by faith alone in Christ. Absolutely based. <laughs> Absolutely based. Saint Tikon, oh, uh, Saint Aquinas, uh, you know, uh, a lot of saints use faith alone. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, who's not a saint, obviously, he uses it in his commentary on Romans. So it's like just the word. It's all about what do we mean when we use the words, mm, yeah. right? Like, because <clears throat> um, Father Daniel Sozoyev uses those words, faith alone. It's slightly different yeah. in the English translation, but it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, that's and it. And so it, the question is what we mean by it and what we that's mean by it. faith. And even in a stream a good, uh, good while ago where he tried to critique the Protestant understanding, Christ, uh, Christian, Christian here, Milton Thomas, actually made the good point of the definition of faith itself. Whereas with a Protestant, we'd say that it's the general real disposition of the will towards Christ. Whereas for a Roman Catholic, according to Christian, it's the full submission to all the articles of faith, um, which is practically well, works out very differently. Um, with yeah, Orthodox are very similar. Faith, faith, we would interpret as its literal meaning in the Greek, like faith and faithfulness, it's the same thing, but faithfulness mm -hmm. includes works. So like we could say you don't have faith because you don't have works. And it's not because works aren't a proof of faith. It's because literally it's like a faith without works just doesn't exist. Hmm. So uh, it's, which not so coincidentally St. James talks about, but whatever. <laughs> so you want to sneak in there. Oh, my St. James, my St. James. Radio, radio. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think there's, I don't, uh, 
to think there might be other questions, but I don't know. Is there anything else about the doco or the topic or whatever you want? Well, to I saw that C- uh, Senor Reformador, or how you pronounce it, said, is the act and the schism itself a heresy? And the Ooh, answer yes, the answer would be yes, right? Because that relates to the film. Like, we go, well, what is, what's the cool thing we're going to have the YouTube thumbnail say? And it was, uh, I came up with something, and then you came up with something. And I think what we settled upon was the sin that split the church, right? The yeah. sin. Because that that attracts one's attention, and it is a sin. And would both sides in the schism equally be guilty of heresy? From the Protestant perspective, that could be true, right? You know, but of course, you know, the Orthodox presupposition would be the side that goes into schism would be the one in heresy, right? Um, even the mm-hmm. most, I would say, tending towards Orthodox schismatics like Novatians and Donatists, which would otherwise visually be very little different and theologically be very little different than the Church. The reason they went to schism, like, oh, you know, uh, your ordinations, whatever, would be a kind of theological heresy. So um, that would be the answer to that question from the Orthodox perspective. I don't know what uh, your view is. Yeah, well, I actually kind of explained it. I kind of explained it already, but it, it would highly depend. So whereas with Orthodoxy in that it's just the mere fact in and of itself of going against, um, of going, creating another jurisdiction outside of existing leadership, um, despite the quality of that leadership itself is schism, it's heresy uh, in and of itself. Whereas in a Protestant view, like with my own, I'd say that normatively, by default, that is a sin, yes. Uh, however, there would be exceptional scenarios like what I mentioned earlier, wherein it may not just be right, but even necessary to just just wipe the slate clean with a, with a local leadership, for example, and bring up some new leaders. So it, for me, uh, for my position, at least, it would very much, it's, it's much more cut, clear cut, with um with orthodoxy and at least in theory romanism um but with my one with my take and i think arguably a consistent protestant take uh is oh there's a number of factors that go into it um yeah so so it, it'd be complicated it, it depended on the topic like the great the great schism itself is so far removed in a different context like i just say with with a protestant view that the whole thing of just splitting over very particular very particular theological points and the issues of i think wasn't um leaven and unleavened bread like a factor as well although yeah it, it was yeah yeah so issues like that um and the filioque way those things those things being the spawning ground of um of split and of parallel jurisdictions i think that's just even from from my perspective that's just a sign of just how that that's just a sign of a mad fall and such a fallen fallen state where yeah. you allow the church to be the the visible manifestation of the church to be split on such issues like that. Now I'm happy you brought that up, um, particularly because the bread issue I think is important, um, but I actually don't think that played really such a big role in the actual schism. It was just something people were able to focus upon. But that aside. I want to say something that, that's sympathetic to Protestants outside looking at this stuff. In a sense, you have to understand to the Orthodox and Catholics, what they value in some respects is very divorced from what most people think is actually important, right? Like the filioque, whether or not how the Holy Spirit originates. You go, wait a second, I thought he was God. I thought he was unoriginate. Well, in a sense, he is. We're talking about you know his, his eternal divine difference in relationship from the Father. What's it even mean to most Protestants, right? Like <laughs> most people don't even think about that. And so I could kind of see where a Protestant would look at this and go, well, obviously this schism is a result of, of Christendom becoming so obsessed with these things of myopic importance that really don't affect how people relate and to God, let alone each other, that God kind of just leaves them to start getting be split over these myopic things. And I would say that makes sense, particularly to the Protestant review because they come from Roman Catholicism. I think the only way to really respond to it would be it's not myopic if you really are immersed in orthodoxy because then the sacraments are so much a part of the faith. And so you start seeing uh, these myopic doctrines actually affect how you do daily worship, how you do daily prayers, then it becomes a real issue. But if it's just theoretical, yeah, it's, it just seems ridiculous. Yeah, I, I'd simply say I'd simply say with that that look, it, it only make an issue with daily worship and prayer if that was put in as such a big part of daily worship and prayer in the first place. 
So with me, I, I'd just be like, look, guys, wh why is that? Why even, why even making liturgy that goes into such like hyper particular theological points where um, at least, again, at least in my pro view, obviously orthodoxy would say, yeah, no, you can't do that. But otherwise people who can hold virtually identical views on everything and have a very good, harmonious, cordial life, Christian life together, um, nonetheless degree, disagreeing on a filioque, that, that to me just shows that it's such a, that it truly is myopic. It truly, truly is. And um, even though it isn't an orthodoxy, I'd simply say it becomes non-myopic and orthodoxy because you chose to make it that way, if that makes sense. No, it's, but I think this is why schism is such a crime. Because if people just were humble, worship God, love God, love their neighbor, they wouldn't be inserting themselves in this. They'd just accept what, whom those God has put in authority teaches and there would be no need for divisions of these things to be able to take those energies and evangelize those who aren't Christian whatsoever. And so that's that's why, like, you know, you, schism itself has split Christian against Christian, and it's really divided our ability to save souls. And so it is a heinous crime. Um, and so, yeah, it's myopic. Well, if it's so myopic, then why are you making an issue of it? Just accept the Orthodox doctrine. So that that's how the orthodox would view it that's kind of, i'm not gonna lie that sound that sound that's that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of sounding like the uh okay how do i say it without getting banned off youtube but the the group of the activists for people of certain sexual proclivities saying well what's wrong with just using pronouns it doesn't affect you right just <laughs> it almost sounds like that well it doesn't affect you why not just use it it's like but i just don't want to what's wrong with that <laughs> the um I saw Dalton Blackman say, what exactly? I think way to prefer pronouns, my word. Oh. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> Good old pronouns. Um, Dalton Blackman says, what exactly is going on between Eastern Orthodox and the Orientals? Uh, What's the relationship? And we covered that. I just want to add one thing, just because he sounds like he's a Protestant. Um, yep. Is that Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox are really much closer, not only just in like their practices and how they look, um, but also just like how they feel about one another. They're, they're more they're more familial in a sense than Roman Catholics and Orthodox. Uh, so it just just be aware of that. You know, there's much more mutual respect. You know, people might not see that because uh, some of the polemics on YouTube, but I'm just talking about like in the real world. Um, there's much more mutual respect between the Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Oh, and, okay. and I see... Senior Ramformador says, now that there are divisions between the Orthodox bros of Russia, Ukraine conflict, does that mean that both sides are wrong, just one, or none of them, what implications does this have? And again, because I don't make this tube about Orthodoxy specifically, I'll just say real quick, that's a local break in communion. It's different. It is a schism, but it's different. Like, it's sort of like there's a difference between a guy that gets drunk at a Christmas party and kisses his neighbor's wife, which is terrible, versus him having a serial affair and, you know, yeah. all that. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's degrees of sin. And yeah. so we would see that it's not... covered in the doco, the different types of schism. Yeah, so that wouldn't be going all the way, even though it's heinous. I think all schism's heinous. Um, that being said, the implications that conflict on these actual big macro issues pretty small but if there are wrong or right side i'd argue that actually the Constantinople's wrong and uh, i have an article on that called uh, on the heresy of neo-papism or something um and it gets at two reasons why which are very specific because it, it helps you understand how the early ecclesiology of the church works there are appeals to, between patriarchates but the only ones that are absolutely binding have pan-Orthodox consent. And we see that in the ecumenical councils. Fair enough. Got ya. Got ya. Oh, this is, this is an, this is going to be an interesting one. This might be slightly off topic, but I'm interested in what EO's and EO's opinion is on David Bentley Hart. I've heard what others prots and RCC think, but what's an EO view? Well, I've been attacked over my response to him from, uh, Father, I don't know if he's still in the Orthodox Church, but I guess he will always attain to uh, the title. Um, Father Kimmel, on this issue, and quite frankly, just, he's he's wrong. He's not only, he's wrong with how he deals with St. Gregory and so he's wrong with how he dismisses the rest of the patristics, and he's logically wrong. He's ultimately a, a, a hyper-Calvinist, right? Not even <laughs> Calvinist or that Calvinist. He's a hyper-Calvinist. The presumption is after death, God just changes everyone's will. 
<laughs> but if if we don't accept that, if we if we believe hyper Calvinism is heresy, which even Calvinists accept, then how do you have universalism? It just doesn't work. And so it's it's sometimes people think these heresies they're intricate and they're really intelligent. And it's like I'll give the guys at most holy family monastery credit. They in their response to um, it's an anti Protestant video they made, and they said generally they say heresies have a really obvious error in it. And the devil just leaves it there, like almost as a joke. And I don't know if that's true, and I wouldn't cite them as <laughs> that's a good way to put it, actually. <laughs> as as authorities, like as in spiritual, because they're not orthodox saints, obviously. But it does seem to actually work out that way. There seems to be like really obvious, crucial errors out in the open, which everyone just pretends don't doesn't exist, but it's hmm. it, it's there. And I'd say in universalism, it's it's just it's plain hyper Calvinism. It's it's plain yeah. predestinarianism, which uh, Gottschalk <laughs> was falsely accused of. Um, I think if you actually read how he explained himself, but that's what he's known for. Um, and again, if that's wrong, it's he's not any saint to me, so I don't really care, by the way. But the point is, if something is so extreme that even the heretics condemned for it might have not even affirmed it, right, then you've got a really extreme ideology, which you should be considered. <laughs> you know, like, so for example, there's this really large heresy in the in the orthodox orthosphere that all infants are saved irrespective of whether they're baptized which would be contrary to orthodox councils and so many saints it's really quite bizarre um that people would take this so seriously and it's not only pelagian right this idea that infants are just like these blank slates that are totally holy totally synergizing the grace of god so they're by default all saved it's not only pelagian Hear me out. It's hyper-Pelagian. Why? Because in the Synod of Diopolis, Pelagius was accused of that idea, and he rejected it as too extreme. So if even Pelagius finds this way too extreme, then it's beyond Pelagianism. So I think, yeah, a lot of these errors are just like, they're just so obvious. People try to make this like this rocket launch when it's like, dude, if you're past the heretic that everyone condemns, that no one affirms, if you're past that guy, then you got to reconsider your your position yeah yeah that's it if for me the super glaring obvious error with universalist arguments is that god actually cannot do as he wills with his creation he cannot judge evil as he wills um and if he did it this way he would necessarily not be a perfect god uh because i say so and that to me is the fundamentally such obvious cringe of universally universalism absolute purified cringe um Good old purity. What, what else have we what else have we got here not a whole ton um oh here's a okay I, I i don't know i don't know if this would be too spicy if you want to answer it or not but eric says my father-in-law passed recently the night prior to his death he sang amazing grace in his sleep and was passed trusting in christ as his savior would chris i think you mean craig, craig say he would certainly damn since he was not eo absolutely not because we don't judge individuals um you know we could say there's no salvation outside the church and we could affirm that, but I I don't know the case of individuals. We believe Trajan's in heaven, and he persecuted Christians. So when it comes to individuals, really? we don't we don't trust that. Also, I've I've heard just like when you're in the real world, you hear stories. Um, in the Orthodox um, theology, one of the things that we believe is that people that go to heaven that are saints are given a advanced awareness of when they will die. All right, it's 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 a, considered like a miracle that saints will experience and one of our teachings is because demons don't know the future so if you if you are accurately told the future it absolutely occurs it's from god and uh, nor could they read minds by the way it's in the life of saint anthony so that being said um one of my co-workers said you know and he's uh he's a methodist by the way he said you know um my father's an old school farmer he just wanted to die at home you know, I'm in upstate New York, so he's still like a lot of people that are old school and people that knew people that are real old school, you know, like good salty earth people. And he's like, well, he said, is it snowing yet? And it was like in the middle of late April. And so it doesn't mean it never snows in upstate New York. Wouldn't take a miracle for it to snow. But it was like kind of warm, like, no, it's, what are you talking about? They just like, you know, he's dying, right? He's losing his mind. And... The next day, he literally died, according to the story. And as he died, it just started to snow right then and there. And my Methodist coworker doesn't know Orthodox spiritual teachings where this would even be meaningful to him, right? So to me, if I had to guess his father's in heaven, because how else would he get that, that, uh, that awareness of it? 
and, and that would be my own application of Orthodox spiritual teaching. So I will not judge individuals. I'm absolutely certain there's people that weren't in the Orthodox Church are in heaven because we we affirm, for example, that trade is in heaven. So it's like that's that's a settled fact for us, but we don't consider it normative. It's not the normal way that salvation occurs. And just like there's people that have survived falling out of airplanes without parachutes. There's a, it's a list of like six people. It has happened like 20, 22,000 feet, I think is the record. Um, but uh, I wouldn't say we should expect that people with good right. intentions falling out of planes are not are going to survive the fall. Yeah. Okay. This is interesting because I remember you talking well before. You you're fairly you you were and you still are fairly fairly strong and explicit on the point. No salvation outside the church. Be consistent with that. Um, how does what you say now uh, about? Well, I've always said it's normatively okay. <laughs> true, but there's there have been people outside the church who we believe are saved and all that, and it could happen. So how does that how does that differ substantially from what you've critiqued of the Roman position of like Vatican II, for example? Well, I, don't, I haven't critiqued Vatican II. I'm not. I'm under the impression that okay. Vatican II actually teach the it actually fundamentally teaches there's no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church, but it right. just in a charitable way calls other people brothers. Uh, um, but I haven't read a lot of Vatican II, so I'm not going to go defend Vatican II. Okay. Um, Maybe I misheard you. But what I would be against is people saying that there's salvation outside the church because it just contradicts the saints. I'd be against people saying that uh, a Protestant has an equal shot at it as an Orthodox Christian um, <clears throat> because, again, that goes against the saints. Right. Um, but what I won't judge is an individual because I do right. not know. Because, for example, St. Barbara is one of our saints. who her, She was just liturgically commemorated uh, a few days ago. It's kind of like where the story of Rapunzel comes from. It's about a saint, uh, a, a virgin that's up in a tower, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So anyway, the thing about St. Barbara is she was a righteous pagan, and she just came to know God by looking at the stars, like Romans 1 says. You know, you could see from creation that God is there. And so God sent an angel to convert her and give her the gospel, <laughs> right? And so, like, who am I to judge what angels have visited people? I don't know the answer to that question. So, you know, so the point is, there's, I don't think anyone's saved without faith in Christ. I don't think anyone's saved with hearts set against the church, you mm -hmm. know, um, at least normatively. And so, yeah. but that doesn't mean they visibly always look that way. Like, obviously, Trajan, yes, we have a letter where he said, eh, let off and persecuting them so bad. But the bridge between that and him being open to the church is evidently fat vast but we can't see the heart we can't see what occurred invisibly because like usually the person visited by the angel sees the angel because that's a spiritual grace and people around it might not see the angel um we can't judge that right mm -hmm. so um as i said we affirm what's normative i say this a million times people in my discord channel who follow me know this is how i talk we affirm what's normative. We do not affirm. We do not make rules out of exceptions. Exceptions exist, but exceptions are never the rule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Fair go. enough. Yeah. So, no, so salvation outside the church, normative, but not necessarily every single case. Yeah, I, I just think people get so hyper focused on the statement that they yeah. lose all rationality and how it yeah, actually right. applies. So. Yeah, that's it. They kind of apply like an analytic one to one thing. Yes, um, exactly. Really quickly, then, before we keep going, um, and perhaps before we wrap up, uh, would you say, would you have any, take any specific issues with uh, what Vatican II specifically said with Lumen Gentium regarding salvation outside the church? To um, I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't read it. So I, I really yeah. don't know. Um, so I, I just don't know what it states. So sorry. It's, Fair I'll enough. say this Fair as an Orthodox apologist, because it's not like I sit out to be an apologist or whatever. Some people make a point out saying everything about Roman Catholicism is wrong. It's all clown churches. There are a bunch of clowns, clown, clown, clown. Vatican II, clown, clown, clown. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, the post trads kind of put on the clown, clown, clown. We're, you know, we're tough, cool chads, but that's all clown, clown, clown. And, um, you know, John Fisher 2.0 and stuff is like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with it. And I think that's the better, <laughs> if you're a faithful Roman Catholic, I think that's the better way of approaching it. I, I'm like, you know, I think Alan Rule's wheelhouse, for example, is like he's more of a recreational medievalist, right? Mm. You know, I'm more recreational, honestly, the early, I particularly like pre-Nicene history. Me too. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's where you and I are very similar. It doesn't mean I haven't read anything past that, obviously. Uh, but you'll see even in my own work, once I get past like the fifth century, it starts becoming more and more secondary sources because I just don't have the basis 
you know, in primary sources to really analyze it. So I just feel like, you know, if Roman Catholicism is wrong, it's not because of Vatican II. It was wrong way, way before that. And, and that's really the whole thesis behind my schism video. Right, right. There you go. What do you think of the Caesar, the other Paul, what do you think of the Caesar papism of the 12th century Byzantine Emperor Manuel, Manuel uh, or Manuel Komnenos? I read the section you sent me, um, uh, Alan, on the thing, and I, I, I don't have much to say without reading the, the rest of the work, I guess, beforehand. I mean, hey, as, as I mentioned, this area of history, yeah, not, not massively my, my cup of tea. Um, so I don't really have an opinion on, yet, uh, on it yet, of course, other than just like curious, very strong claims he makes. Um, so yeah, there's that. Paul, that can see you without exact uh, on nulla salus in your video, um, Lumen Gentium 15, skip over 14, which gives the proper context. I know of 14, I do know what it says, um, but I still, uh, I the reason why I left it out is because I do believe nonetheless that Lumen Gentium 15 makes key comments which uh deserve or which pose a which pose a problem. I do genuinely believe that. So I'll make it known, even if you think I do take it out of context, it wasn't. This wasn't um, on ignorance on my part or malicious. I just genuinely believe uh, paragraph 15 speaks for itself. Um, let's see, let's see. Especially enlightening stream. Thanks so much for this. Covered a lot of questions that I had. Why? Thank you very much for coming along the line. I'm happy that I answered you. And I'll share again, because I think I accidentally shared the link of this stream rather than the doco before. But Whoops. follow this link, people, in the live chat to watch Whoops. the doco itself on Craig's channel. Literally, watch it. You don't even we, need the link. Literally, look up Great Schism on YouTube right now. It's, one it's of number three. Results, kid you not. It's still one of the top results. Kid you not. Kid you not. So look it up. You'll find it. Craig's channel. We've passed well over 8,000 views now, going skyrocketing all the way to 10K. Let's go. Um, but yes, go Let's watch it. Let's get it over 9,000. That's it, people. That's it. Let's get that happening. Let's get that happening. So that uh, so that we can see that there's enough interest for uh, for Craig to help bankroll another documentary project by myself. That'll be pretty epic, people. Well, and, Actually, and guys, and please leave comments on what issue you want covered. Creatively, I really I really want to do indulgences. Yes, I'm not. Ask but you I'm not sure like that. how. Like I don't know, Paul. Like how do you get like the interludes in it where like it look good? Like it's not a lot of action shots, no maps or anything. So like. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it, it might look more like an Ubi Petrus video, which is like almost like a slideshow with this guy said this, this guy said, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it'll just be a more basic documentary. I just feel like it would let people down because what you put together in this one was just like so fantastic. Yeah. But maybe we got to let them down. Okay, I tell you. Yeah, yeah. So, so an indulgence documentary. So you say they'll just involve a lot more he said, she said, not as much. Well, well think, about, think about indulgences. There's no geographic movements so much. Yeah. There's, there's no like sides where they look different. So think of it from a visual perspective. What do you portray in a documentary? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, but if, for example, you speak about giving alms, but you have a clip of people, you know, people giving money to a homeless guy. I don't know if there's stock footage and stuff that's free. Like, all right, that becomes more like a documentary, like Economics Explained or whatever, where they just take all those kind of like uh, free shots of people doing roundabout things. Right. Then it could work. But I think creatively it might be more difficult for us to do. So we'd have to well, discern that. Well, with the issue of indulgences, wouldn't geographical considerations play a bit of a part? Like, oh, this, this view started popping up here and then it spread over here. Would that happen in it? Much? A little bit, but really, the best scholarship shows it. It it's it's like everything bad's attached to the papacy. It, it it's indulgence theology was pushed by the Pope because he literally has a monopoly and all the indulgences worth having. Having like or ordinary Roman Catholic bishops can only give like indulgences. They give you like three hundred days off purgatory. Like only the Pope can give you lifetime out of like you know lifetime absolution. So, uh, and, and indulgences for the dead. So like the ones people really want, only the Pope has. So of course, who's not going to like it? The conciliarist. So, right. So the conciliarists are all against it because they lost their customers, right? Let's say you're the local monastery that used to give out indulgences. Now you've lost your customer to the Pope who will just give it out to whoever gives them money. Okay. You know, right. So, so it's, it's, it's interestingly because it's very economic. Like you sort of have to kind of understand supply and demand to really understand indulgence because it's very economic. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking, so maybe there could be some, because something something I, I like to do with mine, um, if it's like, oh, Bishop so-and-so of this place said that, um, if it's like a bishop of a region, then I could show them on a map, like, hey, bishop of this place, and then an icon of that person over that spot. So that could yeah. give some excuse for map shops. But also, I guess if this is going to involve 
a fair bit of interchurch politics, like between the Vatican and monasteries and all that. There could be yeah, a it's hard good to number pictures. of shots of those. There could be a good number of, of those kinds of shots. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely do it. How, how long do you think that one will go for? I'm curious. That one's going to be longer though. It's going to be an hour about. And the reason, you know what I mean? It's a very different kind of video because the reason is to actually answer that question requires a whole understanding of biblical almsgiving, which is a fascinating topic. There's way more uh, on the issue in the Lord, the words of our Lord than people really think. And so I think a Protestant, see that one in a sense is a more neutral video. I think almost everyone other than like hyper post trads would watch it and really like it. Cause like most normal Roman Catholics, like they're not getting indulgences for the dead and like, you know, paying for them, right? It's an irrelevant question to them at this point. So it's like, actually it's more of a like general thing. It's already, there's already an article out and so people could read it. But it's more of general interest. And I think the what Protestants would be very interested in would be how the Lord treats how almsgiving works within us spiritually. And then the question then would be, did the early church apply the words of our Lord incorrectly? It's, it's very interesting. And then once you get to actual indulgences themselves properly, they have zero connection what you see in the early church whatsoever. They literally, the sort of things, the precedents for indulgences were the exact opposite of what became indulgences. It's, um, I actually made that critique to Dr. Gavin Ortlund where he said, oh, there's early precedents. I said, uh, I said, if you understand what they are, they're absolutely not precedent. They're literally the exact opposite thing. It's very fascinating, but it requires more detail in some respects than the schism. Yeah, there you go. Alan Rule, you need the graphics of kings and generals of the primary sources. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm wanting to work up to a degree of graphical consistency because with the doco, well made, but like I use different maps and different visuals and all that for it. Um, but I do eventually want to get to a stage where stuff I produce, at least for my channel, because like it'd be kind of weird if like there's the exact same aesthetics for like uh, for like hideout projects to different channels and all that. Um, but at least for my channel, when I make big big time projects like this, I do want to have a consistent aesthetic. So maybe like my own high res world map with like location names and all that, and somehow having like an animation software to do like borders and all that jazz. And perhaps just make other um, other set aesthetic things, and just just go with different aesthetic things for like different projects, different channels, and all. I just to make sure there's some diversity. So yeah, that is the aim. God willing, it'll be pretty epic. Uh, order, truth, involvement. Do you, Paul? Do you believe the Eucharist genuinely has the body and blood of Christ? Uh, ontologically, no. Typologically, it is the body and blood of Christ. That's that's my take. Um, and then Alan Rule again. Question for Craig: What do you think of the 13th century Arsenite schism? I actually don't know what it is top of my head. I, I might know it by a different name, but it uh, doesn't ring any bells. There you go. Okay. Oh, here's a good one. What do you think of Cyril Lucaris, Craig? That's a really good question. And it's one where my thoughts have are, are really evolving because I'm trying to come to grips with what's going on with it. But I'll just be tentatively, he's a saint in the Orthodox Church. He was martyred. Um, and so if someone calls him saint, Cairo Lucaris, and okay, you know, um, I think pretty convincingly it's been shown that Cairo Lucaris didn't believe what was in the confession. Uh, so, because we've got primary sources of other stuff he's written in direct contradiction of it. So it's, that's not the issue, but what's pretty well agreed upon is that he certainly let people think that he wrote it and he never publicly denounced it and he's condemned for that. And so then it becomes really hard because we got a pan-Orthodox council, Jerusalem 1672, that states that pretty much he's certainly not a saint. So how do you go from a pan-Orthodox council saying this man's certainly not a saint to him actually being canonized? You go, hmm. You know, that, that shouldn't work. And this is where people have to understand the consent, the reception of all Orthodox to a canonization proves its truth. If there's question about it and people don't accept the saint, it shows it might not prevail over time, sort of like an ecumenical council or an alleged one like Ephesus II. So my suspicion is that Carl Lucaris is not a saint because of how I esteem the council's analysis of him, a pan-Orthodox council that has been received by the whole church. And now what we're going to see is eventually the synods that have accepted him, which are only two, the ecumenical patriarchate and Alexandria are going to drop him, or we may find in a matter of years or decades, maybe as early as 2025, that Alexandria and Constantinople may be in communion with the Roman Catholic Church and no longer in communion with the Orthodox Church. And then it kind of makes sense. And in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, 
uh, they have all sorts of sa inconvenient saints. They, in fact, when the do when their doctors of theology is an Arminian, right? So like an, an uh, Oriental Orthodox person, how do you have a, a doctor of the church fundamentally in disagreement with your own dogmas? I have no clue. So like, in a sense, the Roman Catholics like the Ethiopians. Everyone's a saint, so they can just accept everyone. Uh, but in orthodoxy, Kyrilo Karis is a way bigger problem, and it doesn't, unless there's something I just don't understand, or or something like that, or there's been basic um, procedural issues in his canonizations, or something like that, which would invalidate it, which I don't like those sort of arguments, I would more likely think he'll eventually be dropped, or to, it may be a sign of who's going to eventually leave the church and go into schism. Fascinating, very fascinating. I think we might call it now because I've got a, there's some stuff I've got to get on with in my day, some pretty important stuff. But this was nice and long, nice and detailed, good chat about numerous issues apart from just the doco itself, but in particular the doco, kind of like a very big advertisement for it. People, watch it if you haven't watched it already. And if you have already watched it, watch it again, get up that view count, make it go to the moon, let the algorithm take it off. It'll be truly, truly epic. Something that will truly like, like the film, share the film, Go to orthodoxchristianity.net. Go to, go to christianforums.com. Go to different Facebook groups. Go to the um, Orthodox Roman Catholics uh, United Facebook group. Go to the Papacy Facebook group, group. Go to all the groups and spread this thing. And even in Roman Catholic, because a serious conversation has to be had, right? It's not like this was made in bad faith. It's citing a bunch of legitimate sources. We got to talk about this. And quite frankly, I don't see anyone else in 23 minutes laying out the issue so succinctly. So let, let's let's share the let's share this movie. Let's get over 9,000, let's get over 10,000. Let's let's make this thing huge. That's it. Make it huge people make it very huge. And just before we sign off, a big thank you to my financial supporters. You guys are absolute legends helping me make all this stuff possible. Orthodox. <laughs> What? <laughs> or this oh yeah, he he has built his entire identity around your slip of the tongue. So so feel feel honored, feel honored. I'm part um, of something. <laughs> but seriously, guys, if it wasn't for your financial support, um, it's not it's not a livable income yet, of course. Although I do hope one day this becomes at least a substantial side income, if not straight up living livable income. But even now, the me at the humble point I am now, this helps make helps me make all this possible. It helps me invest in new equipment, new software, and just do it at the frequency that I can do it. Because if, without this financial support, I would be much more frantic in finding more permanent, higher paying work, um, uh, and thus not be able to make the content as frequently or as high quality as I am now, and wouldn't be able to increase it to the degree that I am now as we speak. So thank you all so much for your support. And if you want to support me, you believe in what I'm doing. Link below to subscribe star, super epic. And likewise, also helps me make more docos. Um, although, of course, I'm intending to make that a, a, a distinct uh, income stream as well, being hired out for documentaries. Uh, but nonetheless, this helps me sustain myself even in the in-between jobs. So thank you all very much. Super appreciated. And uh, Craig, thank you so much for coming on. This is an epic chat. Very, very good chat. Um, I hope everyone uh, took something from it. Uh, including including Roman Catholics and other fellow Protestants in particular, getting a getting a feel for the worldview behind this documentary because it truly is just if you if you're not if you haven't interacted with Roman or Orthodox views before and you watch the doco, no matter how clear it is, you'd be like, what the heck is happening? What what is he even saying? What's this canons? What's this consensus? This guy's talking about and all that jazz. Um, even though it does do a great introduction to us uh, to basic concepts like that, but otherwise, I hope everyone who's watched this has learned it learned from it. Um, Craig, do you have any final words? I'd say it's great to be on. It's always great to work with you. You did great work, which I'm very grateful. It's not possible without you. And uh, let's Thank do you. it again sometime, maybe with Alan Rule. <laughs> That's, it. That's it. Hey, hey, that'd be that'd be that'd be that'd be fantastic. If any Roman Catholic content makers want to hire me, because uh, I, I did this specific job for free because I hadn't because uh, I wanted to make this as like a kind of a, a portfolio demonstration of what I could do uh, before anyone commits money. But now it's out there. I'm able to be hired for, for the good old shekels. Uh, if anyone wants to make a project, including any Roman Catholic commentators, as long as it's not something fundamentally aimed against my beliefs. If it's something uh, within Roman Catholic, uh, into Roman Catholic Orthodox or Roman Catholic Oriental, whoever dialogue, I am happy to make it. You can hire me. It'd be epic. Um, I'm just still kind of figuring out my exact rate, how I'd go, what's a good level. Um, but yes, 
to sign us off, ladies and gentlemen, to quote from the venerable Sirach, fight for the fight to the death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. Thank you very much, people. God bless. <laughs>